Nā mai, hari mai. Uh, greetings and welcome to this session, this EHF Live Investor session. So Edmund Hillary Fellowship, it's a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So this session, you will hopefully um, have a good conversation with Andy and Aaron and hopefully learn a little bit more about Andy on a personal level so that you can touch base with him after or any other time and it's sort of you get to know what his uh, intentions are for New Zealand as well. So this session though is going to be interviewed, uh, Andy's going to interview Aaron, uh, Aaron is going to interview Andy and Aaron is from Pienza who is a SAS guru and he's been helping out Callaghan Innovation actually at the moment as well on the what SAS looks like for New Zealand and going forward. So I'm going to hand over to you, Aaron, and you can take it away. There will be Q&A later on in the session. Cool. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so if, and I think if you have any questions along the way, feel free to just put them in the chat. And then I think at the end, we'll go back and, and kind of go through them. Uh, but feel free to, to mention them as we're going. So I'm excited to, uh, to intro Andy, who um, I've known for, I guess, close to 10 years now. Um, and uh, I, I, I met as part of the Seattle Techstars uh, community, and we'll get to that a little bit. But Andy was a, uh, a mentor and an investor and someone that kind of was very helpful throughout my journey. And I think we'll touch on a lot of stuff. Um, uh, Andy's had a, a, a great career and I think a lot of things to, to learn from, but I think one thing that I thought was interesting is that um, the Seattle ecosystem uh, has, you know, has gone through a metamorphosis and in, in it's from a tech ecosystem, I should say. Uh, and Andy was a really critical kind of pillar to that whole process. And I, um, you know, getting more involved with New Zealand, I, it reminds me a lot of kind of Seattle, um, you know, uh, maybe I don't know, five or seven years ago, as it was making its kind of um, progress through, uh, you know, starting lots of technology companies. And anyway, Andy was not only, uh, you know, saw that journey, but also participated as a, a key piece. So I think it'll be fun to talk about that too. So um, anyway, without further ado, maybe uh, Andy, I'd love, you know, in your words, do you want to start with kind of um, to talk a little bit about uh, you started as an entrepreneur and then an investor and, you um, and then we can kind of get to kind of what you're doing now and your interest in New Zealand and stuff like that um, towards the end, but maybe a little bit of history on, on your, your background. A little history on my background. So I'm the, <laughs> I'm the second of four boys and I have, uh, I had real authority issues with my father. So we'll start there. <laughs> uh, which made, which made me, uh, made me a perfect candidate to be an entrepreneur. I knew when I was in college that I was going to be an entrepreneur, that I would be a shitty employee. And um, I mean, I joke about the authority issues. I had them in spades. Um, and, uh, and so I went to, I was a computer science undergrad, went to business school at MIT, came out of MIT in 1994 and started my first internet company. Um, I went three for four as a operator of venture funded startups, startups that was all on the East Coast. I moved to Seattle in 2000. And um, when I moved, the venture landscape in the United States was really, there were two sort of cities in which you could get venture capital. One was Palo Alto and San Francisco area. And the other was Boston. Boston was second. There were a number of venture firms um, in Boston. And when I moved to Seattle, you know, there was two or three venture firms, but only one really active venture firm. And the entrepreneurial ecosystem was, uh, was a significant step back from what it was in Boston. Uh, in Boston, there was both capital mentorship and a number of young, uh, a lot of young talent coming out of the various universities. There were seven universities in Boston. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, and uh, and I thought that the ecosystem uh, was suboptimal and lame. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. So I'll stop there. Uh, ultimately, in two thousand seven, in two thousand seven eight, 
I started a seed stage venture fund and brought tech stars to Seattle, but, um, but I'll, you know, that's my background. That's great. Um, so kind of double clicking a little bit on Seattle, what, so you've, you've, I didn't realize you came in 2000. So you've been here a little over 20 years. Uh, and what, if you, if you think about the kind of how the ecosystem's grown and what have been some of the key pillars, like what, tell us that story about like Seattle and what it was like in 2000. And then, and honestly, probably a lot of people on the call also don't probably know even you know, where it is today. And so maybe a little bit of that story. Yeah, so I mean, I th let's start with today. So I think today, Seattle as an entrepreneurial ecosystem is quite vibrant. Um, there are a number of, um, there's a lot more capital to be had. I would say it's still probably somewhat undercapitalized, but it's a vibrant eco uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, there's definitely, I mean, Amazon and Microsoft have played a major role in attracting talent. Uh, people are leaving those companies and starting new companies. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Techstars started in 2010. I think it did play a major role in, in helping the ecosystem come together and get, um, get more activity and support and mentorship. Um, uh, yeah, I would say probably Seattle is probably third now in the um, venture capital landscape in the United States. It's, you know, Silicon Valley, New York, and then Seattle would be my, and Boston is sort of probably fourth, um, followed by Austin. And what were some of the, like, um, if, if you, how, how did Seattle kind of grow? Like you mentioned, you mentioned a couple of pillars of, of things like, um, you know, education, like having kind of computer science programs or schools, having capital, having mentorship, like, what are those, what were the key kind of drivers as Seattle developed and, you know, and then maybe also kind of thinking about other ecosystems and how that, is that a common playbook or is, are they all kind of do it differently or how do you see well, that playing out? Yeah, I mean, I would say for sure, I mean, talent is where it starts, talent and number of starts. And so you, young talent who, uh, you know, uh, uh, idealistic, un unawares of the risks of starting a company um, and just really how hard it is. Um, naivete. <laughs> yeah, naivete. Um, I mean, at least in the US, the venture industry has done a really nice job of, of creating the dream that people fall into uh, and then realize they're in a nightmare. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I think Seattle really benefited. I mean, we benefit a lot from being the lower cost two hour flight away from Silicon Valley. So geographic location of Seattle is really, I mean, it's interesting that Seattle took off more than LA, but I think there's definitely an element of uh, geography that played a role. And then, you know, you can't, under, you can't understate the role of Amazon and the growth of Amazon, um, which, you know, 20 years ago uh, was, I mean, I remember the building that it was in, Amazon used to be in one building. Um, and now it, it owns, you know, a good portion of the city and literally downtown. Um, so I think the big, it's Amazon and Microsoft, those two companies in particular is attractors for tech talent and managerial talent, et cetera, uh, with the geography. And then UW has really come along as a, uh, as a top tier, uh, engineering school. So those things I think played important ingredients um in helping the ecosystem i think tech stars just to switch to tech stars for a moment um uh the first class of tech stars in seattle was 2010 it was the third city so tech stars started in boulder went to boston and in year two went to came here to seattle i knew the uh early investor i'm good friends with brad feld he had been an investor in my company uh, Ryan McIntyre, who is Brad's current partner uh, and a, um, a fellow at EHF. Um, uh, I, went to the, I went to speak at the Boston Techstars event for my 40th college, I'm sorry, for my uh, 25th college um, reunion. Um, and um, 
And I remember leaving that and I, and, and I, was, I was really moved by that experience. And I, I, I left the room of you know, 10 startups and, uh, and was kind of in tears remembering my origins as a first time entrepreneur and the role that Brad and some other mentors played in helping me successfully launch and exit my first company. And I called Brad and said, Hey, if you want to do this in Seattle, I'm happy to do it. And that led to um, me returning to Seattle, uh, getting a call from David Cohen saying, let's do this. Um, I then went about and sort of in a painstaking fashion, uh, Techstars Seattle 2010 was the first investment that all the existing venture capital players wrote checks into. Now they weren't big checks, you know, 25k, 50k. Um, like they weren't. It wasn't a, a uh, it wasn't a, a lot of support. But the fact that I went through that process and there was a vehicle that was not about Andy Sack um, or my venture fund. It was a different thing. It was Techstars, and this was about growing the ecosystem that's how i that's how i pitched tech stars seattle and that's what um brought those that capital together in its first deal and i think that played that was important because the early some of the early deals i got referred were from those venture firms they would have companies where the companies weren't far enough along and they'd be like oh let's put this in tech stars um, and so they'd refer it over whether or not we accepted them or not was another matter, but I got a number of referrals of deals that way and the, and also got referrals of mentors. And so that really set the stage for, um, I think tech stars to be a meaningful player in the evolution and maturation of the ecosystem. That's great. And, um, so tell us a little bit, maybe transitioning to you as an investor, um, how, did, how did you think about, um, you know, Techstars companies and, and what, what the ideal Techstars company was? And then maybe also with your angel hat, you know, what is a, well, how do you think about a, the, the ideal angel investment? And then you know, I know you think you've started a couple of venture funds at this point. So like maybe that also as a, 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 what's the ideal venture backed company look like? And, you know, are those three different or, um, how do you, what, what's the, the ideal kind of scenario for each of those? Yeah, so let's, I mean, if we continue with Techstars, Techstar, like a lot of it depends on stage of company. Techstars is effectively pre-seed. Um, so it's mostly two or three people, men or women, uh, and they have an idea about what they want to go do. Um, at the pre-seed stage is really, like I sort of disregard particularly during Techstars, I learned to disregard whatever their original inception was of their business and really just focus on the team. Um, uh, Aaron, you were a good case in point. <laughs> Aaron, for those of you who know, the way we met was Aaron sort of, I, I had, so I had a coffee event. Uh, it's amazing how important a coffee shop can be in the evolution of uh, an ecosystem, but I had a, I went to a, I had a local coffee shop that I went to it was convenient for me. And so I started hosting open coffee there. I think Aaron came, Aaron had a business that was sort of interesting, but I tended to ignore. And, um, but it was he horrible. And I to, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're being way too kind. It was a horrible idea. <laughs> I didn't want to call it out and say it really sucked on, uh, you know, I, I was being politically kind. Um, <laughs> It was a terrible friggin' idea. Uh, now that Aaron's uh, now that Aaron's mentioned it, um, but we had coffee and and we hit it off and 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 he evolved and he ultimately applied to TechStars and went in and you know grew a business and was super successful. Um, so it was talent, talent first. And what did I look for? I look I looked for I looked for people who had authority issues with their father. Is that the? Uh, I think a lot of people talk about good entrepreneurs have a, a chip on their shoulder that makes them irrational and make irrational decisions, right? It, it, maybe talk a little bit more about why, why, why do you yeah, look at like people the, with a, a, a troubled past, if you will? <laughs> no, it's authority issues. Like nobody wants to, like, nobody wants to be told what to do. I don't, I think even people who don't have real authority issues don't like to be told what to do, but entrepreneurs for sure don't. 
and you fall into that category. Um, I don't know what your relationship was with your dad. We haven't had that conversation. Um, uh, you know, that's I, I, they don't put that on the Techstars application. <laughs> <laughs> they probably should, but they don't. Um, you know, the Techstars application is what's your background. We, we looked for builders, right? So um, uh, team had to have engineering talent. Uh, preferably, they would have built something. Um, so that counted for a lot. And then we, um, uh, I think without that, you don't get in. And then separate from that, you're just looking for what they've done in the, the most recent past and sort of, that either that naivete or the desire to go um, plant a flag somewhere and, and build. That's great. And I think that that ended up working out pretty well, right? I think the maybe. Yeah, the, the, insane, the insane, insanely well. Yeah, do, maybe tell us a little bit about like the, the 2011 class of Techstars. Uh, I think the, I, I saw a headline More. recently yeah yeah, two years before ours, yeah yeah the class before aaron's 2011 was the best class in techstars history i think it was the best class in any accelerator history um including y combinator uh three uh three unicorns in the class um out of, remit, 10, right? out of 10 remitly went public uh two weeks ago at a seven billion dollar valuation uh techstars invested at effectively 1.5 million pre so it worked out and what are, I, i'm i'm always curious um with investors it seems like investors are in kind of two camps like there's um like mark andreessen did this blog post about markets always win right um i'm sure you've seen that where it talks about if you you know if you take a a, a great team in a bad market it's not yeah, yeah. The outcome no, he's, he's, yeah. he's right he's right I mean, markets, so markets, do, do markets, you... markets do win, um, you know, rising tides lift all boats. Um, I mean, what's interesting about the, the class that we were just referencing in Techstars, the three unicorns, only one of them started with the idea that they still are working on. The other two had major pivots two or three years in, um, like well after Techstars. So... So that goes to it's not you know they they the the team had a pivot into the market that then helped lift them up and I do think it is a case of markets um, at the time of TechStar it really comes down to sort of stage I think you can bet on talent sort of despite market and and idea and product and you know the smart the smart talent will figure out where they need to be it may take them longer but that that happens but I I, I firmly am a uh, rising tides lift all boats i mean i was lucky enough in in my first company to exit in july of 99 if i had not sold at that time there's no way that deal happens six months later and it was pure it was pure market got it so so markets always win but a great team in a bad market can always find a good market and that's kind no, of not always <laughs> I mean, yeah. the market will cr um, the market will crush the the great team if if they don't move. Sometimes, the team is is you know crazy enough to pivot. That makes sense. Um, and what do you for maybe for entrepreneurs out there, um, New Zealand? What do you today talk a little bit about? What do you look for? I know you do. You, maybe you, you could explain. You do some angel investing. You've got also a fund. Maybe talk a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah. So I've I've recently started a um, a fund of blockchain nature native blockchain native venture funds. So it's a fund of funds. So I've actually gone up the stack, um, looking for investment managers and and venture capitalists who are operating in Web three. Um. I still do angel investing, uh, both in funds and in companies. Um, you know, my I look for high quality team solving a real problem um, when it's a software company. In the Web three space, I'm all about sort of NFTs and gaming these days, as as Aaron will will tell you. Um, and I've I've sort of been deep in the NFT landscape and really enjoying that space. 
And there it's, it's actually more, it's, it's different. It's, it's, it's not, you know, there's still like great teams solve a problem, but in the NFT space, there's a lot more, I don't know. There's a, it's a lot more hit driven. There's a lot more uh, uh, other dynamics. Uh, marketing plays a really key role. Community plays a key role. Distribution plays a key role. And those things really don't matter in, in standard SaaS startups. That makes sense. And so for, so you're um, to kind of frame the ideal folks for you to talk to, it would be, Obviously, anyone that happens to be creating a, a crypto-related, um, yeah. crypto-focused venture fund, um, and and, and uh, you know, and, and anything in that space, like I'm, I'm willing to talk to entrepreneurs. That my fund is, is, you know, we have a limit on what we can do directly um, into individual projects. Got it. And so, yeah. So then, entrepreneurs that are crypto-focused, and then generally, kind of any software entrepreneurs and that's out of your angel pocket versus your your best right. pocket for that last right. one that makes sense um and maybe what is it like uh so you've started two funds at this point right from from scratch and i think founders co went on um you guys did a couple more funds maybe what yep. is it like starting a venture fund what are um what are lps like how is it different than being an angel investor um I mean, what do I want to say? I mean, uh, raising a venture fund is you're in um, you're in perpetual you're perpetually raising capital. So and you're not building anything. <laughs> so you know, there's just a really long cycle from raising capital, deploying it. You know, ten years on one hand is a, is a short period of time when when you get older and uh, and um, but when you're living it day to day, it's quite a long time. Um, and so there's a, the feedback cycle of being a venture capitalist as opposed to being an entrepreneur is long. Um, you're not interacting with customers. Your customers are investors. They occasionally are calling to check and see how their investment do, is doing. Hopefully you can say, I haven't lost your money yet. Um, you know, but when you have lost their money, you know, they can be, some of them can be or, ornery. And um, you know, build, building a building a venture fund is. Uh, um, I actually really really like the industry. Um, I think it plays an important role in in um, in an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Capital is really important. Um, I think EHF, uh, the investor fellows of which I am one. Um, you know, it's it, it's been good looking at deals in New Zealand. Uh, if you're in New Zealand and have a deal, I'm actively looking for other investments there. Um, so I think capital plays an important role, actually growing a venture fund is really hard. Like you got to get talent, you got to get deal flow and tech stars played a really important role in, in the success of my first venture fund founders co-op, um, those companies that the class that we just referred to, we invested in two of those unicorns and, and our returns are off the charts. I mean, I think they're top decile. Um, in terms of, I mean, it was a small venture fund, but our returns are really, uh, they amazed me. So, <laughs> and I never would have, I never imagined we'd make that much money. I think, uh, so Lily, you've got a, you've got a question. Do you want to hop in? Uh, kia ora. Um, thank you for sharing your wealth of information there, Andy. Uh, just a quick question. In terms of Aotearoa New Zealand, um, I'm presuming um, you have aspirations for our uh, ecosystems here and maybe supporting. What, one of the areas I'm noticing is, is all about SaaS software development. Um, we have limited, um, uh, great, huge amounts of technology companies, but there's, we have huge amounts of businesses and, and in particular, great moldy businesses, but they're not necessarily in that tech space. Um, uh, um, and most of the venture capital um, to help sort of scale some of the businesses purely in that tech space, or uh, uh, is there any appetite for sort of moldy businesses to support? So let me just make sure I got the question correct. You're basically asking, do v, do, does most VC focus predominantly on tech sector? Is that the question? 
a little bit and, 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 and how you see yourself um, in New Zealand and contributing in some positive way of building the ecosystem here in New Zealand? So traditionally, the answer to the question, fortunately or, or unfortunately, depending on your sector is, yeah, VC skews strongly towards really towards high tech, not even like, I mean, they play a role in biotech and, and health tech, but at least in the United States, tech uh, VC skews strongly towards high tech. Um, the rise of web, web three sort of, you know, falls in that category. Um, and that's largely because that's where, you know, returns are, their returns in the public market, et cetera. And the ability to scale companies is much easier. I think today, um, uh, climate change uh, and climate change funds, I think, is the new area uh, that VC is starting to chase throughout the 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 um, the entire um, life cycle of companies, both from C to A to you know Series C and D. And so I think climate change is going to get a lot of venture capital, going to get money from the government. But I think venture capital and venture capital returns over the next decade, I, I kind of don't think there's a better space than the climate change space. Um, you know, things that fall outside that, uh, you know, basically need to bootstrap or find alternative sources of fit, um, funding and financing. I It's worth mentioning, I also started uh, a company um, a, a finance company called Lighter Capital, which um, does royalty-based financing, um, uh, re what we called revenue loans. Um, and that's an interesting alternative uh, and, and more bootstrap-oriented entrepreneurs can, um, uh, can use that capital, but they're nowhere near the size of investment. Um, and you need real revenue in order to get revenue-based financing. So um, my plan, um, you know, I'm super excited about the ecosystem. I think there are some similarities to what it was like back in 2020. I'm sorry, back in 2000, when I arrived in Seattle, uh, I'm super excited at some point to get into the country um, and uh, participate in the ecosystem in New Zealand. Um, you know, my, I'm, I'm fortunate I, uh, I won't be investing solely in tech. Um, you know, I, a good founder can sway me. Um, uh, I like food related businesses. Um, my stomach is an easy way to my, my wallet. Um, so, I mean, I don't like restaurants, but I like food related businesses, I like a whole host. So, I, you know, the right entrepreneur can, uh, I've invested in coffee companies and beer companies. And I guess that's not food, that's drink, but. You get the idea. I'm living proof that you'll you'll bet on a, a bad idea with an entrepreneur you think has some potential. <laughs> yes. Uh, Rosalie, it sounds like you uh, you had a question too. Yeah, kia ora, Andy, and thank you so much for this uh, kōrero. It's uh, it's really valuable. Um, I'm I'm just interested in exploring where you see. Uh, both the challenges and the opportunities within the New Zealand ecosystem right now. So for us, we have, as you've noted, a, a, an emergent uh, innovation system. Um, and while there are some areas of growth, we still have considerable uh, challenges, both in growing and scaling our businesses, as well as increasing um, the volume. So I'd be really interested from your perspective and what you've been through in Seattle, where do you see the opportunities in the areas of momentum and where do you see the critical gaps? Um, I mean, there, you know, there's no question that uh, New Zealand has some raw materials that, uh, that should make it, uh, should, should make it a vibrant ecosystem. One is, you know, obviously the current situation of borders, well, let's set that stuff aside. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I think, New Zealand, there's an element of um, critical mass, and then there's an element of sort of uh, follow on and next stage. So I think in the case, meaning those are challenges that New Zealand ecosystem faces. So the distributed nature of 
uh, ge geographically, um, both of the um, uh, the country, um, but then also just the you know the cities. You don't you don't have the equivalent of a Palo Alto or New York that really drives it, and that lends itself to okay, companies can start and they can start to make progress and they can get enough money to get going, but actually getting to scale. If they do get to scale, you know, people taking notice of follow-on financing to actually get the results, um, I see as as factors that you know need to be overcome. Um, I think you got to play to your strengths. So I think agriculture and climate change are two areas where um, where I would look to build critical mass, and that means pulling together a community of both entrepreneurs and investors and putting weight behind the winners um, uh, and sort of everybody chipping in and hoping that somebody breaks out to make a huge win. Um, yeah, it's not easy and it takes a lot of time. And I gotta tell you what, during the process, like I didn't know in the midst of it all, I, I didn't know that I was actually being successful at all. Um, either, either yeah. um, from an ecosystem perspective, or um, or a financial perspective, and it turns out in both cases, looking back today, looking back five years ago, ten years ago, turns out it was a lot of that has to do with market and luck. Um, yeah, you know, and and so it was a labor of love. Like I wasn't I wasn't making money. Um, I was working for a lot less than I could have been making elsewhere in the market. Um, but I did it largely because my heart, uh, you know, I'm a community minded guy and, and I had people help me in my first company. I wouldn't have been successful had they not helped me period. And so, uh, I really liked the opportunity to give back and, um, and because of my authority issues, I don't tell people what to do. I just ask questions. I've, sorry, just to, to follow up, you noted the importance of Amazon and Microsoft and the growth and their ability to both attract talent and also to create um, opportunity, I guess, for spin-offs. We don't really have that in Aotearoa at any kind of real scale. Yeah. And I just wondered where, you know, <laughs> where is the opportunity for us around that talent piece? I mean, it's interesting. I, I talk about those two companies and their role. Mm. And I think it's probably, I think it's true. I mean, they clearly, Amazon clearly moved a lot of people from other parts of the country to Seattle. And those people, uh, I, I suspect, you know, like did spin, some of them did spin out. At the same time, I don't want to overstate their role because most of the people that went, and worked at Amazon and, and Microsoft really were not entrepreneurs. I mean, Aaron excluded. Um, uh, you know, most of them were happy to take a paycheck and be an employee and and contribute to those those enterprises. So I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's super helpful, but it's not critical. Uh, I think strong university is young people, young talent is critical. Uh, and an organizing function around the community is also critical, critical and risk cap capital is critical. Um, we happen to have Microsoft and Amazon, and I think they were helpful in establishing the city um, as just an attractor to come. I think there are other attractors that New Zealand has that, you know, clearly are at play here with EHF. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's useful. And I think the talent of EHF should, you know, bodes well, bodes well to the community. Like what attracted me to EHF, I was like, oh, I get this. Um, yeah. You know, like it was an immediate, uh, it resonated me with, with me instinctively uh, and deeply what EHF's mission was and how it was going about it. So the raw materials from the support and community side, are, you know, we're just impeded by this wonderful pandemic. But all of the points you say, like, it's going to be a labor of love and there are real challenges to act like, you know, the market needs to swing in New Zealand's favor to allow it, those businesses to actually get to scale and attract yeah. the capital 
Um, like the market has to move in that way. And if it doesn't, you know, it's a long slog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andy, you mentioned climate change a couple of times. Um, I'm curious to, and I know you've spent a lot of time here. Uh, I, I, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about where you think that's going. Cause I think one, one thing that surprised me, um, you know, kind of coming back to Lily's point too, I think I've been really surprised that, that the venture world seems to be kind of going outside its comfort zone with, with climate investments where, you know, they, they look at it and they're like, this isn't quite a tech company or the time horizon might be more than 10 years or, you know, this, this may not, this doesn't have the kind of scale mechanics that like traditional software does, but still are kind of leaning in because they're just, it's, you know, they, they, the, they believe that the market is gonna is going that direction so much. Um, so anyway, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like, is it is it going to be different? Um, do we see different types of investments happening there? And like, uh, like for example, I, I wrote a small check to Energy Bank in New Zealand, you know, and it's like, I mean, it's it's offshore energy storage. I mean, it could be far further from like what I know and understand, right? And like, um, the the go to market is selling to like you know, huge uh, uh, energy companies or governments and stuff not. Anyway, so, you know, and I never, if it, if it was like a restaurant or if it was a, I don't know, any other industry, I'd be like, that's, I can't do it. And I don't understand it, you know, but I was like compelled enough that like, it feels like this is the future so much that we can step out of our comfort zone. I'm curious if you think that we're going to yeah, see I mean, if you, just a, yeah. If you subscribe to Mark Andreessen's uh, um, comment about markets, that markets make companies, you know, we're either gonna we're either gonna implode as a species, or climate change is gonna be solved. And in order for climate change to be solved, there's gonna the regulatory environment is gonna change radically in the next five to ten years. Government is gonna be a driving force. Uh, consumers and businesses all can, it's gonna be all hands on deck. And so, the next generation of massive company growth with you know, with large tailwinds is clearly climate change. Um, so, you know, I, you and I both, well, I mean, I applied to EHF with a climate fund. Um, I was about to raise that fund just as the pandemic hit. Um, I ended up backing off and going back to sort of my comfort zone um, and getting more involved in Web3 and crypto. But there's no question that, uh, at, a, at the highest level that there, that there are going to be enormous companies uh, built in the next decade in, in response to the um, situation we all find ourselves in. So that market's going to go and as, and you know, the capital is going to, some capital is going to make uh, venture like returns. So you're, that's what you're seeing. And I think without that, that situation, I don't think, uh, you know, um, Kleiner Perkins tried a climate fund, I want to say 15 years ago. Um, it failed. It was ahead of the market. The market wasn't there to get behind it. Now the market is. I mean, so let's hope. And do you think the one thing that I'm always amazed by in New Zealand is just the, the government helps, like it actually does help. <laughs> Uh, it's like net positive. Uh, in the U.S., you're just always hoping it's going to get out of your way, uh, and not ever expect anything positive out of it. So, do you think that that it, it seems like the the New Zealand culture is very focused on like climate and you know the, with a government that can be nimble and get behind things? Do you do you feel like climate's a good opportunity, uh, like for New Zealand to shine? And, and yeah, a hundred percent, I do. Um, I mean, I. And I think it's natural resources. I mean, that would be for sure the area that I would be a area that I would focus on because, um, you know, whether it be government or the ecosystem, it just seems to lend itself and be well positioned. Cool. Uh, and then maybe lastly, to kind of tie it all together, tell us a little bit more about your your kind of short term and long term plans for New Zealand and. Um, kind of your I mean, if, um, I'd like to get one of the 50 spots with DHF, <laughs> so we'll see. I'm waiting to hear. Um, you know, if I can, I'll catch a plane tomorrow. Um, just You just got to let me know whether I can get in. Um, 
uh, yeah, I'm excited to go. I've been planning. I mean, I, each year I've been planning to go. Um, so it's been a, a little while since I've been to New Zealand. Uh, I, I've enjoyed from a distance and with the use of Zoom, uh, advising uh, companies and venture funds. Uh, I'm actively looking for deals. People should feel free to reach out to me offline. Uh, my email is my name, Andy Sack at Gmail. Uh, yeah. That's great. And so um, kind of any software entrepreneur and then obviously a focus on crypto um, uh, is kind of the, that's your sweet spot for folks to reach yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way. There are other ways, but it just, it, you know, it, you get, particularly if it's from New Zealand right now, it, it requires, uh, um, I'm a, I'm a people person. So, you know, it's, hard, it's, it's just trickier to get me on a zoom call and build relation that when it's mm -hmm. thousands of miles, it's not impossible. People have done it. So, and, and I've made investments already in, in a, a number of companies. So. Oh yeah. Um, well, that's great. Uh, any other questions for anyone in the room before we, uh, we wrap up? Yeah, kia ora. Um, this has been really interesting conversation, uh, far, far more vibrant and real than some of the other sort of investor type who we have been involved in. Um, yeah, I, I like this. I'll take that style. as a compliment. Yeah, it is. And I don't compliment much, Andy. Um, <laughs> But, um, Lily, but, Lily we'll, we'll get along well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that in terms, I go back to my Māoridom because that's where my passion lies. Um, it, I, I mean, I also hope you wanted the 50 to come through. But A, if you do, please come to Tairawhiti East Coast because we've got great food, great kai here. Um, but more importantly, uh, I presume you understand the intergenerational ways of thinking that our business is operating. So it's not so, so much about the here and now, it's a little bit more about that mm -hmm. building that relationship style. So I'm just wondering if, if, if you've managed to have a little bit of um, understanding within kind of the funeral culture, or if you need some or would like some. Um, I, I know enough to be super dangerous. So I, um, I have beginner's mind. I look forward to the education. Anyone that wants to hold my hand and teach me, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah, well, I'll hold your hand if you come to our region, East Coast, no problem. That'd be my pleasure. There'll be a lot Just, of that, Andy. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities to learn. Yeah, and we'll, yeah. Um, we'll have them there for you, particularly if you get to New Zealand. Yeah, I'll just miss my return flight, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good reasons to so, go to Dubai and Gisborne. So Andy, just to, to reinforce, we are working hard on the border entry. We really hope to hear something soon. Um, things are moving behind the scenes bit by bit. But um, just to, to note, this particular topic in this issue is one that is very close to the government's heart right now. Um, there's been quite a lot of work about how can we help to mature and amplify our innovation system so that it becomes an economic engine. And they're even talking about a startup minister who I think they're appointing as Minister Nash, who's the Minister for Economic Development. So, uh, this, so this is an area that, because we believe that the EHF fellows bring such a unique set of skills, resources, and perspectives to this, mm -hmm. um, that we are going to be holding a session in November um, where we're bringing together those from Aotearoa who can talk about the challenges within the system where there might be opportunity so we can begin to see and look at the areas that we can bring fellows together to really help at a systems level uh, to mature and move our ecosystem forward. So if you've got thoughts, would love to hear that. Um, we're, we're just sort of working through what the structure of that might yeah, be. Yeah, Rosalie, I, I'll just offer mm -hmm. anything I can do to help. Um, feel free to ping me offline. Uh, Thank you. You know, I think having the government support, I mean, government can, can play a meaningful role. Um, and, I, you know, and I applaud your efforts like it, it, it's a labor of love and, and you know, and, and things move. Inertia is a strong force. So uh, making change takes many years. Um, but, it, you know, like Seattle is a, yeah. like compared to where I was 20 years ago, 
the entrepreneurial ecosystem, if you get in Seattle is night and day compared to what it was. So, um, you know, I think the opportunity exists, anything I can do to help. Lovely. Andy, I had, a, I had a question for you. Um, I'm a VC oh, in New Zealand. Um, I spent 20 years um, in Seattle, actually working in Amazon and Microsoft before I moved back here to my home country. So I can, I, I've sort of seen also firsthand some of the changes that you're referring to. And if I can kind of compare that journey to New Zealand, like I, I think we're at a point now where, you know, you never have enough capital, but there's an absolute bunch of capital in the country being raised domestically, coming offshore from offshore funds that are trying to invest here, invest to migrants that are, you know, with their wallets at the border, you know, trying to come in and bring a bunch of money. I, I think where we struggle is really with talent and with, you know, human capital. Our universities are not necessarily, you know, world class, I think, from a tech point of view, um, we're putting less people into STEM every year. So it's, it's declining in terms of its popularity. You know, we don't have kind of the Microsofts and the Amazons yeah. here to spin people out. So bringing talent in is quite critical to what is our constraining factor at the moment. Um, but I'd observe that having people come for periods of short periods of time is helpful. They can bring um, knowledge and connections but having people that are willing to kind of move permanently um, and sort of set up shop here, I think is, will be a breakthrough for us. And when I think about the move between San Francisco and Seattle, it seems like one of the drivers of that was actually the, you know, Trump, you know, pulling away the local tax deduction. So Seattle, just from a tax point of view, became, it was close to San Francisco, right? So you could still get there. And yet you didn't have to pay that income tax, the high income taxes that you had to pay in California. And so this notion of tax policy being supportive of bringing people more permanently to a place. I'm, I'm just wondering how, how you're thinking about Aotearoa in New Zealand from that point of view, because it seems quite a, a hard place to move from America, from a tax point of view. You can come and spend you know, three to five months in the country every year, but when you get over that kind of six months in the country and then fall into both countries' tax nets, you know, I, I wonder to what extent, you know, that's something that's going to deter us being able to get talent permanently relocating here to start businesses in the same way as you saw, like a, a you know, Glenn Cowman, you know, or the guy Nick from Off Nick Hassar from Offer Up. Like, there's a whole set of entrepreneurs that just said, "I'm done with San Francisco. I want to be somewhere maybe that's a bit more family friendly." And then they moved to Seattle, you know. And and I I, did, I don't know if if New Zealand is seen as a destination to do those sorts of moves. What's what's your opinion on that? I mean, so you touch it. I mean, your comments are uh, you touch on a number of things. Let me. Yes. <laughs> so, what, so one aspect that I want to touch on before I actually answer your question, I you know, just from a distance, you know, so all via Zoom. My sense is is that uh, that the lack of talent and entrepreneurial talent that is one thing that uh, the United States has not lacked. Um, and and my sense is is that capital is lead. I, I'm concerned for the New Zealand ecosystem, that capital is leading the way over entrepreneurs. I think that's right. You know, um, so that's, and that's a tougher problem. I mean, on some level, we haven't talked about it, it means that probably your fathers are doing a much better job in New Zealand than the fathers in, in the United States. But, um, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial uh, genes and, and um, instinct you know, is very strong still in the United States. How do you create that? That's a tough, that's a tough values, you know, values play. Um, and having capital lead is a surefire way to both lose a lot of money and, and dig a hole for the ecosystem. So, so that concerns me. I don't know what to say about it. I just, my sense, what your comments resonate. Yeah, absolutely. That. Yeah. Um, separate from that, uh, you know, you, you moved pretty quickly to a, comments about relocation and tax ad, advantages, advantages and, and attracting permanent talent to New Zealand. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot to be worked out within EHF. I do think that taxes play a major role in, in attracting and retaining 
uh, talent in a location. Um, I've seen it even state to state in the United States. Uh, I think that played some role in in Seattle's uh, the you know the people as you mentioned people moving from Silicon Valley to Seattle. Uh, you're seeing that and as well as other matters in the the rise excuse me of Austin. So how that plays out in New Zealand, I have not dug into sufficiently the uh what my what my tax future looks like when i relocate to new zealand i probably should but maybe i shouldn't and i'm just gonna go so um yeah so taxes are a big deal it turns out that you know if you look at it in the incentive system people follow period yeah there's more than tax for sure and getting people to kind of relocate here obviously but you know talent i think you're right like capital is a head of talent and we need to grow it internally, but that's really long lead time. Um, yeah, and I don't. The, and it's the short hard. term is how do we get people to move here? And it's hard. And then so then you're like, mm. oh, am I? I'm importing entrepreneurs. Okay, that um, you can do that. I mean, you know, the U.S. did that for much of its history, mm. um, and it worked well for us. But um, so I actually think that you know you're on the right path. I would just. Um, uh that that's actually a re, you know being even more aggressive on the Im the immigration of entrepreneurial talent separate from capital is probably uh something that i would i would lean into from a government and um ecosystem perspective thanks yeah and the us isn't doing we're not doing ourselves any favors on the immigration front as of late so maybe well, neither is new zealand as of late but <laughs> Well, great. I think that, um, that that was a great session. It wraps everything up. Uh, so if, if people want to reach out to you, Andy Sack at Gmail uh, is the best way. And you're also in the EHF um, Slack group. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone that's in there. So. Yeah, Good. my th thanks to Michelle and Rosalie. You guys are doing a great job. Everyone from EHF. Aaron, thanks for having me and for organizing this. Super helpful. Uh, everyone, thank you for your time. And thanks everyone. And the recordings of uh, Aaron's session is also, I've just put it on the, the chat channel there, the, the live sessions. So Aaron's uh, interview is recorded there as well. And Andy's will go up there either today or tomorrow. And also look at the ones that we've got coming up uh, next month as well. And we just keep adding them over time. But um, hi da everyone and have a really good day. Enjoy the rest of your time. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.